in de software development, like you can't know any, you can't know everything. It's impossible. You have to just like be the kind of person who learns how to do the things you need to learn how to do when you need to learn them. I, I never just took a day off freelancing. It's not like I had like complete control. Uh, that is romanticized 100%. You're working a lot when you freelance. Today I'm speaking with Kelly Claus. I first met Kelly when she joined the instructors team at Bubble. She went from being a complete beginner with no technical background to professional freelancer slash Bubble instructor faster than anyone I've ever seen in this space. And now she's working as a senior dev for a venture-backed startup called Swapstack. She's also been traveling for a really long time, living that digital nomad life that we've all romanticized at one point. Together, Kelly and I discuss how her experiences traveling have impacted her career trajectory, the fastest way to become a proficient bubble developer, and much more. If you're enjoying these conversations, make sure to like and subscribe to the channel. And without further ado, here's Kelly. So you're in, you're in Portugal now. Yep. Yep. I'm in Portugal. We got to Lisbon a week ago, a week and a half ago, I think. Yeah. And you've been traveling all over the world, freelancing, working abroad for quite some time, I know. And yep. I feel like this is something that is very romanticized. I think like a lot of people um, maybe will look at social media, let's say, and they'll see their friends or just, just people in general traveling and living this, this digital nomad life. And mm. you've been doing it for a while. And I'm wondering, how have your views on, on living that life, traveling from country to country, working abroad, changed over time, if at all? Because I think you've been doing it for like six years, right? Or maybe yeah, in February, it'll be seven. It's six, so seven whatever years. that is, six and a half right. years, yeah. Of uh, So how have your views changed over time? Yeah, I feel like real curmudgeonly about it these days, like a little bit the sort of cliche where like you start something and you're like, this is the greatest thing ever. And then you get to the end of it and you're like, ugh, don't do it, you know? <laughs> Which I don't actually feel, but like I just have moments of that. I'm very tired. I'm very tired from, not from travel, just like I want some stability in my life that I haven't had in so long. And in the beginning, I was like, give me unstable because I have had stable for the first, you know, 35 years of my life. And so I was like ready for, to sort of kick things up a little bit. And, uh, and it was really fun in the beginning and in a specific way, in a specific sort of like recapturing some type of youth that I didn't ever really have kind of way, like a personal, you know, like I'm having fun, I'm seeing the world, I'm like eating foods I've never even heard of, that kind of thing. And now I'm much more focused on like a career that I've built that I really enjoy. Mm. And so being in a new place every couple months is, while it's still really fun, and I still love it, I love my life, I, it kind of feels like it has become something of a burden to have to figure all that stuff out every couple. Like, imagine moving to a new apartment every two months. It's a lot. I've, I've kind of been, been doing that over You've been here. kind of doing it, it right? Lot. It is a yeah. lot. Yeah, especially in the beginning, I was on my own. Now I have a partner, and so we share the burden. But like, we're trying to go to Paris in a month and a half. I've been trying to book this flight and find an Airbnb for a month and a half. But it, it's like, there, you have to carve out time to be like, okay, what area of the city do we want to stay in? Can we afford it? Is there anything available? Do we want to go through Airbnb or something local? Okay, so once we've got all that figured out, now we have to find a place. We have to book it. We have to, okay, who's paying for it this time? Because we don't have a shared bank account. Okay, who paid for it last time? I don't remember. Let's look back at our, you know. And then, you know, you book it. Okay, now we have to book the flight. Can we use miles this time or get, get like I, everything? There's just so many things every single time. It's, it becomes yeah. very annoying. <laughs> Yeah, I found that too when I, um, like earlier this year, we talked about this off mm -hmm. the podcast, but I sampled that lifestyle and went to Mexico by myself and just lived there for a month and a bit. And I, I had no idea how long I would spend looking up all of the things that you just mentioned, but also, especially for us, internet is obviously very, I mean, for everyone these days, but internet is obviously a big thing. Yeah. And I was staying in this tiny little surfer town in Mexico called Sayulita. 
And I spent so much time just looking at different reviews of the actual internet at places. And thank God the internet at the place that I booked worked out well, but there were like roosters around the place um, <laughs> that were interrupting all of my meetings. And, and like that was a difficult thing to deal with. So there are just, there's so many unknowns that, yeah. well, that make, that can make things difficult. I think it depends on the type of career you have too. Like you and I teach and, and do a lot of calls and, and sort of interact with the public. When I first started traveling, I was a web designer. I was like, I just kind of sat on my laptop wherever I was. I didn't really need the best internet. I was working on the Adobe suite. I just needed a good charge on my laptop. You know, I was far less reliant on the internet, you know, on like an on. Now I'm a bubble developer that there's no offline bubble mode. Once you're offline, you're like not working anymore, you know? So my life has gotten much more dependent on good internet and a space where I can do calls by myself. Mm -hmm. So I can't share an office with my boyfriend. I can't, and I can't rent a co-working space that doesn't have a call booth. I have to have a place where I can do calls because I do so many of them now or teaching. Good Lord. Like you need a, a space and a big chunk of time where you are alone and you can talk as loud as you need to. And your internet is consistent and reliable. There's just so many things, which means your accommodations are more expensive because you need more room. Or you got to rent a co-working space. And in a tiny surfer town in Mexico, probably no co-working spaces. And if there are, it's just a room with some desks in it, you know? Yeah, it's tricky. Yeah, that, that was exactly it. There were, I mean, it was there were quite a few co-worker, co-working spaces there. So I did get lucky. But you're right, mm -hmm. it was just like an air-conditioned room. Mm -hmm. And it was quite expensive, too, to just go there for the day. So I ended up staying in my yeah. apartment most of the time. Another question for you, kind of rela well, related to travel. Mm. How do you think your career would have developed differently? You said you're a bubble developer now, and you, you've been freelancing for a long time. But how much, I guess, do you think your lifestyle, like traveling, led you in the, the, the your mm. career path in the current direction it's in? And do you think like, if you would have been at home in one place, you would have ended up doing something different? Wow. Huh. I've never once had that thought. That's <laughs> wild. Well done, Jacob. Great oh, question. You. <laughs> uh, you're natural at this. So I left, before I started traveling, I lived in New York, um, New York City. And so Did you see that, that, that is a timing. That was, uh, hey, whoa, amazing. Whoa, For you listeners, Jacob is holding up an I Love New York mug and it's the best. <laughs> it's so great because you live in. In I live in Calgary, Canada. but I'm actually, I'm, yeah, I'm going to New York also for the first time next week. We're just going on a quick improv trip. Is your first trip. time? Yeah. Oh my gosh, I'll send you all my favorite places. Please do. Yes, yes, please yeah. do. Right. So I left New York to travel, which means I was leaving, you know, the most expensive city in the world. And then I was going to Southeast Asia, which is, you know, pretty inexpensive to live when you make American money. And so I went from like, it's just a complete opposite situation, right? No matter how much money you make in New York, unless you're like a billionaire, you're going to struggle, right? And then you go to the other side of the world where you're like, I could make $1,000 a month and, and, and truly be okay, you know? So it just completely shifted things, which means that the pressure to make like a real living was off of me for a while. While I stayed in Thailand and Vietnam, you know, I, I did kind of, that's sort of the track, right? Like when you first start traveling and you're not making enough money, you, that's where you go, right? Mm -hmm. And so I had the opportunity to kind of explore things in a way I wouldn't have if I had stayed in New York and just simply quit my job and tried to freelance. If I was just freelancing in New York, I think I would have within one month just gotten another job. And then I would have, and I was working in a different industry. I don't think I ever would have found Bubble. So, yeah, I think I would have like st stayed on the track I was on if I hadn't started traveling. It has totally changed my life in all the ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's fascinating. Mm. And now for both of us, I mean, and I know you're, you're working for a startup and mm -hmm. I've been in the startup space for a long time too. I was thinking about this yesterday, preparing for our, our, our interview, that traveling, there's a lot of unknowns that, you know, we, we already spoke about. And... I think there are some similarities in the startup space 
in the sense that like everything is is crazy. You often have to pivot on a dime and and make really big decisions really fast that impact、mm. the direction of the company. And I'm sure that you felt this too as a developer that things can often feel quite unstable in this space. Yeah, I imagine more so than they do for a company that's that's much further down the line and and more established. So, do you think that your experience traveling prepared you in some way for that instability? Like, does it does it still does it still rattle you as much? I guess if it rattles you at all, I don't know if it does.、Mm. But do you know what I'm getting at there? Do you, like do you totally, see like, some、yeah. similarities? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it travel in general makes you really comfortable with discomfort. And with、mm. un- just unknown stuff, you don't know. How, like even something simple, like how do I get to my place? I'm staying from the airport. I forgot to look it up before. Like I got to Cambodia, and I had zero idea how. My phone didn't work. I had no cash. I didn't know how to. Where's an AT? Like, do I take a taxi? In fact, I had to take a tuk tuk. Which I assumed would be like a ripoff, right? Like I assumed that all the tuk-tuks line up at the airport and take advantage of like all the silly white girls that show up. And no, that is how you get to your place from. And I, you know, I had to like get a SIM card from somewhere in the airport, find the cash to buy the SIM card. Okay, then get online and then Google it. And then take the tuk-tuk. It, it took, you know, it was like this kind of like unknown thing. That I became very have become very comfortable with over time of like, well, I don't know, and even if I think I know, like I don't actually know unless I've been there before. And now when I go to Cambodia, I know I can take a tuk tuk and it's safe, and that's how you get there, right? And in the startup world, like, yeah, things just change, and you don't know. You think you know what direction you're headed, and you just really don't, and then. You're in a place you didn't expect, and that's fine. <laughs> like, you're fine. Yeah, yeah. And、um, as you were talking, I was thinking, even just just being a developer in general, I guess. Like, there's this weird point when I started my whole development journey where I realized that it was it was right around the time I started freelancing, and I took a job and I knew how to do most of the stuff, but I didn't know how to do part of it. And then I realized, like, oh well, I think that's just part of being a developer. Actually, is like going into the unknown and figuring out how to do things. Yeah. So there's definitely definitely some similarities there. Yeah, and, and also just like not feeling overwhelming shame when you don't、right. know something. Like、right. you, when you go to a new place, it's a guarantee you are not going to know ninety percent of how life is lived in that place. You know what I mean? And so you just have to like be okay asking questions and learning how how to do things, how how things work, how to communicate. All of those things super super applicable in this world where like in de- software development, like you can't know any, you can't know everything. It's impossible. You have to just like be the kind of person who learns how to do the things you need to learn how to do when you need to. Learn them instead of coming、right. in thinking like I just know it all, you know. Right. All right. So traveling is excellent training for for at least like the mindset part of of being、mm. a developer. We've decided,、mm-hmm. I think. So yeah, you were you were freelancing for a while too, and I think that you know being your own boss is is also something that's that's romanticized in our culture today. <laughs> and just recently, you decided to stop freelancing and and take a job. So、uh, I guess first question, just why why did you do that? Lots and lots of reasons, but if I really break it down, like I could say, like I wanted a four hundred one k, and it was really I wanted to learn a lot from a startup and find out maybe if I wanted to, you know, start something of my own in earnest. You know, all of these things. Like I really love the people I work with, and I was like, I want to work with them, and you know, have colleagues again, which I haven't had for so long. All of that stuff is true, but really the thing that tipped it was I did a a long term con- or like a couple month contract with this same startup. It's called Swapstack, and it's built on Bubble. And I did a two maybe two and a half month contract with them, and we signed a contract at the beginning, and then I didn't have to invoice them. They just paid me. My the money just showed up in my bank account. So I got the first one, and I was like, oh, that was 
that's really nice I, because I hate invoicing. All my freelance career, I would wait weeks to invoice clients after because I just hated it. And how stupid is that? You need the money, right? So the first paycheck shows up and I'm like, that was really easy and kind of cool. And then the second one shows up and I was like, this is the life. You don't have to think about when you're going to get paid or how much you're going to get paid. It just shows up. You show up and the money shows up and how it's so easy. And I honestly, I think that was like the tip, the tipping point where I was like, okay, yeah, I could handle that kind of stable. That'd be nice. But uh, yeah, outside of that, yeah, I wanted to learn some things. I wanted, uh, yeah, all of that stuff I just said. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, the, the predictability of it is nice. And I agree with you when I was freelancing, that was my, my least favorite part of it always because it's not only like, when am I going to get paid? It's like, if someone takes a really long time to pay you, it's like, should I keep working mm-hmm. on this app yep. at some point? Right. Yeah. So there's all I mean, this there's, negotiating this, that you just don't, you don't have to do anymore. It's just awkward. It's just, it's, yeah, oh it's just, uh, it's so, I, I hate it so much. That yep. part about freelancing. There are many things I like, of course, but, but yeah, so you're happy now with, with this decision. It's been going well at this job. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, this is a public podcast, so I kind of have to say that because I'm sure they'll be listening. Ha ha. Hi, Jakes. Right. But like, let's just say lifestyle wise in terms of like <laughs> yeah. predictability. Yeah, for sure. And also, I actually do like my job a lot. <laughs> I'm really happy there. I know, I know. But it did take a few months, honestly. I've worked there now, I think, four or six months, something like that, officially. And the first like three months, I had a hard time, a really hard time making Mm. that shift from freelance. I think there was a lot of like, what am I missing out on? Because like when I was freelancing, I always had like 10 clients at a time. And now I had just the one. And I was like, well, there's other stuff. Maybe I want to be doing. I don't know. I missed teaching because I I stopped teaching bubble. I miss having like the just daily deciding like when I will work. Like I, I never just took a day off freelancing. It's not like I had like complete control. Uh, that is romanticized 100%. You're working a lot when you freelance. But I could like screw around the first several hours of the day and then work into the night and like nobody gets to say anything because I'm my, my own boss and my clients will get their stuff when we've agreed upon it because I will deliver it then. But I get to decide how I go about it. And now... It's more rigid, you know, like I need to be online, at least overlap with my boss at some point and he's in the US. And so like, I got to like, make sure I'm sitting somewhere where we could do a call. So it's just, yeah, it's, it's definitely a different through my day kind of vibe, which I was surprised at how difficult of a transition that was for me. But now I actually feel like really good about that. And I think structure has been good for me, <laughs> you know? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, as as much as um as much as it's nice to pick your own hours and you know, like you said, wake up and if you don't feel like working right away, you grab a cup of coffee and just chill for a while. Mm-hmm. As much as that's nice, I find myself personally at least that I can easily get into bad work habits where oh, yeah. I'll like work way late into the night and then be upset mm-hmm. at myself for not sleeping as long as I should have. Yep. It's, it's, it's easy for me to get into, to fall into the chaos of, of that. Yep. Another thing I just want to mention too, like I was, so I interviewed um, Peter who wrote the Peter Amley, who wrote the yeah, yeah, yeah. He's great. security. And uh, we were talking, he, he mentioned too, and I agree with him that one of the, one of the greatest things is just seeing bubble apps, bubble built apps that you didn't know were built on bubble because they're so, like just professionally designed and work really well and they're great. And I think Swapstack is is definitely one of those. So everyone should go <laughs> who's listening and watching should go and check out Swapstack. Yeah. But all credit goes uh, to Jake Singer on that, by the way. I did not build Swapstack. I'm just now coming into it. And Jake, who is not even a designer, built a really impressively beautiful product. Uh, yeah, it's it's really impressive. Kudos to Jake. Yeah, it's yep. it's 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 great. You found success, I would say, in the bubble space very quickly, much quicker mm-hmm. than than most people I see. And I guess uh, I'm curious if you had to give advice to someone who is just starting out and who wants to learn as much as they can and 
become a professional developer in this space as quickly as possible, what advice would you give? Be a woman. <laughs> I think that's really helped me. Like my gender really works in my favor here because like there's not that many of us. And so it stands out and people, I think, recognize me because I don't. Why do you think that helps you so much though? Like aside from it, there aside from just there not being too many female yeah, developers. Yeah, I don't think that like being a woman makes people want to hire me. I just think it makes them recognize me, and mm. right. Whereas like they might see you and be like another white guy, and and right. just not remember <laughs> that you are you, right? Which it would be a damn shame because like you're amazing. But so I think be, <laughs> be a woman, right? I th think also like. Okay, this is all just coming from my experience, right? I think that being a designer is just such a huge advantage. And, you know, that's just almost like saying be a woman, right? Just be a designer. That's, you know, it takes time to learn that skill. But I do think it's worth spending some time to learn some basic design fundamentals so that when you build something in Bubble, it doesn't look like crap because like, Design just does make people feel like something's more legitimate. It just, uh, that's the function of design. And so I, not only do I think it's sort of a hack to, to like accelerate your career, I actually think like it will help you be a better developer and build better products to learn some design fundamentals. And it's not that hard to learn the fundamentals. You can take a couple courses on Udemy for like 10 bucks, take Gregory John's Build Camp. Uh, yeah, I mean, like you can learn those things. It's not such a mystery. So I think those two things. Um, but also I had a really lucky circumstance where I joined on deck their no code fellowship and I was in the second cohort. Now they have only done three and, and it's actually sh shutting down, but on deck it is, was, I don't know, sort of the state of it now, but like when I was in it, it was just a really incredible networking opportunity. I l met a ton of very cool people who were also building and talking about it online. And they had a demo day that I participated in and tons of people go to those things. And Bubble was my judge. Um, it, yeah. So like I got a lot of attention from being in this mm. sort of public event where I was able to say like, here's a thing I made. <laughs> and yeah, so I think pr participating in public things mm. and, and especially sort of well-regarded public things, like OnDeck had a, a great reputation, has a great reputation for, for this type of thing. And I will say also, I couldn't afford OnDeck when I joined it. It was expensive. And if I had not joined it, I don't think I would have the career I have. So like go into debt. That's my, <laughs> my next uh, piece of advice. And obviously I don't mean go into debt, but sometimes you got to take a risk. Sometimes you got to like invest in yourself when you, you know, it hurts to invest in yourself, but be strategic about it, right? Like don't just buy every course out there. And I, honestly, I didn't join on deck to learn anything, to learn technical stuff. I joined on deck to develop a freelancing career and to network with people who could hire me. And that's literally what happened. Okay, there's so many good things that I wanna dive deeper into there. But let's, uh, let's, let's go back to what you just said about making an investment in yourself mm -hmm. there. So y you kind of mentioned this in, while you were speaking, but there's so many, or at least like it was implied, there's so many different courses out there that one could take and decide mm -hmm. to invest in. What was that switch for you about on deck in particular and why make that investment that was difficult for you to afford at that time? What was it about that particular place? So I was, I knew I wanted to freelance. I knew I wanted to shift away from web design to bubble freelancing. And I was on CodeMap, which is a marketplace for no code developers and, you know, people who want to hire no code developers. And the um, projects on there were like $20 an hour, $30 an hour. And I was like, what? No way. This is way too difficult. It's too much work. And as a designer, I charged several times that already. And so I was like, not going to take a pay cut. I was not going to take a pay cut, right? 
And so I looked around and I was like, okay, so how do I get better paying clients? Like, where are they? And it felt like, and I didn't know anything about the startup world, this whole environment. I didn't know what YC was. I didn't know any of that stuff. But when I found on deck, I looked at their, just looked at their marketing and I was like, okay, it looks like people who are serious about being in this world and like entrepreneurship and building something like come to this place. This is a place for that type of person. And also, I don't remember exactly on their landing page at the time, but there was a lot about how like so-and-so raised X million dollars, so-and-so. And I was like, oh, they have money because they have raised right. money. And that money is meant to hire people like me. So like those are the people that I need to know or at least be in their orbit, right? So that when mm. they need someone, they'll, I'm there, right? Yeah. So I think being in a space where people have money to hire you instead of waiting for people who just need you, because that's different, right? You need people who mm. both need you and can afford to right. hire you and pay you well and have like some space in their budget that like if something takes longer than you or they expect it to, that like they have the money to account uh, to afford that, right? That's very different than like someone saying, I have $5,000 and I need everything to work. And that is right. it, right? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, it's so good. Um, another thing I really liked that you highlighted there too, setting your intentions before going into this course. You've decided mm -hmm. to make the investment and also like I'm making this investment so that I can become a professional bubble developer and get paid what I'm worth. Yeah. So I think that's really important too. It's amazing how like, I've had that before too, where I'll just like, I'll, I've bought courses on Udemy, let's say, where they look interesting and I just kind of buy them and then I never, you know, maybe yeah. I'll do like the first few lessons that day and then never touch them again. And then I've also had the experience where I've bought courses on Udemy too, where it's like, okay, this is, and I set my intentions and it just becomes a much more serious thing. So it's interesting how mm -hmm. being clear about what you want when you may, at the moment you make that purchase can affect how things work out after that. But another thing that that you were, were underscoring there is just the importance of being around the right people and just putting yourself out there for people to see. And yeah. I've noticed you're very active on Twitter. Lots of people have noticed like your, your, your Twitter personality. <laughs> how much, um, how important do you think it is for developers to kind of have their own personal brand, let's mm. say on Twitter or whatever it is and, and do what you're doing there? Yeah, I was really surprised at how important Twitter <laughs> has been for me. Re like really, really surprised. I never intended that. I, I joined Max Haining's community, 100 Days of No Code. And mm. it's like a tweet. You're supposed to tweet about stuff. And I was like, okay, I guess I'll do that. Like I was on Twitter, like watching the election. <laughs> That's how I interacted with Twitter. I was like, what is Donald Trump saying today? Right. right. Like, right. I didn't think of it ever as a professional thing. And when I got in Max's community, you're supposed to tweet. So I just did that. Right. And so it just, I, there was no strategy there on, on my part. Right. So Max's community really on Twitter, on deck, super on Twitter. So it just kind of, I was like, okay, this is what you do in these spaces, I guess. And, you know, found sort of like a nice community there. I will say, I don't think it's, I think it's really helpful if you are the type of person who's good at Twitter. And by that, I mean, like, can just like be a human being, who, mm. you know what I mean? Like nothing drives me crazier than like strategic tweeting. I hate it so mm. much. I feel fake okay, well, when I was, do it. That, that was my next question for you is because I've noticed in particular when, when you tweet and there's one tweet that can, like, there was one that you made, I think it was maybe like two weeks ago now. It was the one where you were like, should I buy this course or should I Google all of my ex-boyfriends? <laughs> and I was, I was reading through that and I just started laughing on the couch. I was like, that's exactly Kelly right there. You know, like that's uh, your yeah. voice. And I, I, I've gone to your website too. And the copy on your website, the way that you write, it, your personality very clearly comes through in your mm. words. 
And has that something that's always just been easy for you? Because there are times when I'm writing and and I'll fall into that trap where it's like, how is this going to be perceived Mm -hmm. when I'm writing it? And then it like affects the actual style of my writing, right? So it doesn't seem like you, I don't know if you have that problem or it seems at the very least like you're better at just being yourself and putting yourself out there in your writing in particular. Has that always come easy for you, is it something that you still think about and work on? or? So, yeah, it's funny. That also kind of was organic. I started blogging when I first started traveling and mm. didn't realize I had a sense of humor. Like, truly was not aware that I might maybe feel funny sometimes. I had no idea. And then people started telling me that. And I was like, what are you talking about? Okay, okay. And so this was many years ago, like, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. And so then I started freelancing and I was putting together my portfolio website. And I was like, this is not an impressive portfolio. So I'll just be funny and people will like me and hire me. Right. And so that's kind of what I did. And I have to be honest, I would say 100% of the clients that actually hired me were like, I like the copy on your website. You're (laughs) funny. So I want to work with you. And I was like, okay, I guess that works. And, and then I developed like a, a, you know, a stronger portfolio and I didn't necessarily need it anymore, but I was like, yeah, but I'm not going to go back and redo my website (laughs) because I was late, right. A little bit lazy there. And so I just kind of was like, I guess that's my brand. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? And I was always an emailer, like spoke, spoke in my own voice in email. So it sort of also carried over into my communications with people. So it was, Mm. you know, I don't know. Also, how boring to be professional all the time. How boring. Right. So that's kind of like how I establish a writing style, I guess. Right. And I found that that because that worked for me, I was like, well, why would I change that? But also what it does is it makes me Sometimes when I'm not like feeling very loosey goosey, I don't tweet because I feel like mm. I, it needs to have some personality in it. And if it can't, ha- if I just can't muster that at the moment, like I just rather not, I just rather be quiet, you know? I don't know. It does put a little bit of pressure on, I feel like I put a little pressure on myself to like n- never say something in just a straight <laughs> way, which is so silly, right. but I don't know. It's there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's this weird thing that happens when you start like putting out content into the internet, I think, where, Mm -hmm. you know, you, when you realized that that was kind of your brand, Mm -hmm. that you had this way of communicating that, that seemed to resonate with people, that you kind of, I think it's, it's easy to kind of get locked into that Mm -hmm. and feel like you have, like that everything you put out there has to be on brand. Uh, but you're, what you're saying is like, if you're not feeling on brand because you're a human who feels different things, and, yeah. you know, and life is up and down and, and you just don't tweet. I just don't. Yeah. I just, yeah. just like hit pause and go like, okay, because I think there's nothing worse. Well, okay. First thing is, you know, like market Twitter, marketing Twitter, terrible Yeah, for, for me. My, it just doesn't suit me very well right. um, to do or to consume, but also like right. trying to be funny. That doesn't work either. If you're not a funny person, don't try to be funny. Like, just, <laughs> no, not everybody needs to, like, have a sense of humor on Twitter. It can be exhausting to look at, like, an attempted joke and just be like, oh, honey, just be, your, just be yourself. If you're not that, then, like, just be who you are. I don't know. That's hard, though. Right. Whenever people give that advice, be who you are. What does that even mean? Yeah, it's like, how, it's like, how the hell do I know who I am? Oh, yeah, exactly. Nothing, right? <laughs> Yep. Okay. I feel like we could talk about that for hours, but let's let's <laughs> let's pivot a bit. What is what is something that makes you most excited in the no code space right now or just the tech space in general, let's say? So that's really interesting because the um the effect having a job has had on me is that I've gotten a bit of tunnel vision where I'm not mm. really paying attention to what's mm. happening, right? Like <laughs> I went a whole day and did not realize until like midnight that Queen Elizabeth died. I was mm. just not paying attention. I was just doing my job. You're in swap stack mode. Yep. Yep. And same thing yesterday, Figma, Adobe bought Figma and everyone went crazy about it. 
And I didn't realize it until like the end of my day. And I was like, wait, what a huge, that's huge. That is a huge deal for, for someone like me. I use Figma all day, every day. And I have like abandoned Adobe and I'm like, cramp, right? <laughs> but like, I didn't know, I didn't know that this big thing happened. So yeah, I don't know what I'm excited about. I, I think I, I have, yeah, I don't know. I can't say, I can't answer that question. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. And so as, as a consequence of this job, I think then you're, like you said, you have tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. um, so at the end of your work day, are you pretty like zonked out? You just want to relax and kind of tune out? Yes. And I also want to eat food. I'm in Portugal and there's amazing right. food here. And so I'll get to the end of my day and all I'm thinking about is like, what meal am I going to go consume right now? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I am, I do feel zonked, but I also feel like, I don't know, just kind of generally excited about like the life Being I in have. in the country, traveling. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I think if I were living in, I know at the, at the beginning of this call, I totally crapped on <laughs> my lifestyle right now and was like, oh, I'm tired of it. But like, man, it's so great. Sometimes, most of the time. It really is so great, even as exhausting as it is. Like, I'm so excited to, like, walk around a different neighborhood that I've never been, you know, been in before and, like, look at how they, like, lay the, the cobblestone in the street in a way I, like, mm. I, you know, they don't, we just don't have that in America. It, yeah. So, yes. And also having, I think, what I'm getting at is that, like, when you have new stuff in your life, when you're not just like settling in, you got a job, you got your house, and then you just like sit in that headspace, I think I would become like, I, th I think I would fall into a depression or something. I think I need mm. some like newness in order to not feel totally zonked at the end of the day. There's got to be something in your life to look forward to, I think. Do you think you'll ever stop traveling around? Traveling? Oh, yeah. Settle down? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, I have, I am, I get in, I have been in nesting mode for three years. Like when COVID hit, we were, we got stuck in Scotland. My boyfriend is Canadian and I'm American. Mm -hmm. And so we couldn't, we couldn't go home. Even we didn't have homes to go to, home to, but like we couldn't go to either of our sort of family homes without getting split up because we weren't allowed in each other's countries. Right. So so we stayed in Scotland for five months in our Airbnb. And all I wanted to do was like buy a new couch for that place and like paint the walls and like buy expensive, fancy cooking utensils, even though I don't cook. Like I wanted all that <laughs> stuff. And because we were just in the same place for all that time, I know five months doesn't sound like that long, but man, it's a lifetime if you're used to moving yep. every month. And I got really used to that idea and it has not left. It hasn't mm. left. I still want to buy all that stuff. And, and every time we move into a new Airbnb, we go to Ikea and buy a bunch of crap. <laughs> not like to decorate or anything, but like, for example, I didn't have a trash can by my desk and I bought this trash can right here so that I could like throw my tissues away while I'm working and not have to get up. And and so like and you, I, just, you just leave you just leave these things in these yeah. Airbnbs when you leave? Yeah, because yeah. number one, they need it because they need a trash right. can in the kitchen or the you know, like come on, buy a trash can. Cheap jerks. I'm sure I'm sure they appreciate that. Like you must I'm get sure really they good do. reviews. Yeah. yeah. But also like it's easier and less I don't know. Like I'm happier to just buy it myself and have it there than I am to be mad at <laughs> Our Airbnb host for not like properly outfitting the space, you know, right. just spend the money. But yeah, I don't know. I, I definitely, we're trying to move somewhere. We're looking at Portugal. It is complicated to move to a country you are not from. And so we're just trying to figure that out. Yeah. But I would like yeah. to be someplace that it's easy to go to other places, in particular mm -hmm. in Europe, because flying. We are aware of the environmental impact of flying as much as we do and, and don't want to, you know, like contribute to <laughs> the, the end of the world. So we'd like to live someplace that we can like take a train or, you know, get around a little bit easier and not have to fly that much. Yeah. 
What's what's the most important book you've ever read? And, important. And why? Back in my 20s, a, a colleague, a female colleague who was probably, I don't know, 20 years older than me, gave me this book. And she was like, every woman should read this book. And it was a fictional book. And it's called The Mists of Avalon. And it's a retelling of the King Arthur saga. But it's about and kind of and sort of from the perspective of the women in the story. And I didn't really know that story well. I still don't really know that story all that well, sort of like the traditional telling of it. But I remember just like eating that book. I loved it so Mm. much. And it's like a huge tome. Like it is a big book. And I remember sitting in a Starbucks (laughs) back in like 2005 and finishing it, like the last chapter, and just sitting in the Starbucks and just weeping like Mm. like embarrassing huge wet red face in the starbucks i have no idea i don't know what it meant to me i but there was something about it that and i have read it several times since like i i Mm. i read it like every year after that but and i still don't i have no idea why i love that book so much other than that it's just like a incredible story and and there's it's an incredible ending and i don't know girl power i don't know that's right. the book you should yeah, read. It's it. um, <laughs> yeah. I, I've I feel like I've heard of the title before, but um, yeah. I don't don't know too much about it. Aside, well, I don't know anything about it. But I was thinking as you were talking that some of the the best books that I read too. While it's difficult to remember all of the details of the book and how it affected you at that time, obviously, it's it's interesting because I can remember the moment I finished them, and it's often a powerful moment too. Like I was thinking about a few of them, and mm-hmm. I. Remember clearly where I was and just kind of how I don't know how I was feeling at that moment and it was yeah. very profound and meaningful and and all of those nice things. I think so it also was a, a period of my life where I was sort of coming away from religion and I had mm. been in this phase of life for like several years where I was only consuming like Jesus mm. stuff, like like mm. I was reading pretty much only a Bible at, or like Max Lucado books, if, <laughs> if your audience is aware of so, Christian literature. Did you, did you grow up pretty religious? Uh, I grew up in the Episcopalian church, and okay. s- which is sort of Catholic light. And it was a very sort of, yeah, we went to church a couple times a week, but it was casual. But in my teens, I was invited to a Baptist church with a friend. And so I and it was a much more like social kind of cool mm. environment for a young insecure teenage girl and so i i sort of dove headfirst into uh, baptist southern baptist kind of life mm. and <laughs> maintained that for a decade and or more yeah and and am not in that in that life anymore but that book was one of the first books that i read sort of toward the end of that time where I was like, oh, you can like enjoy something that is not religious. In fact, the main character is considered to be a witch, right? And mm. sort of dark, dark magic kind of. And, and I don't know, there was just something about it that I was like, I don't know, something else out there. <laughs> That's not okay, what I'm last in. question. Yeah. Last question for you. And this, mm-hmm. is, this is a bit of a crazy one, but I'll, I'll ask it anyways. So when you think back about those early experiences, getting into religion and that that community, and then you were in theater for quite some time too. Mm-hmm. I always like to, a fun thought experiment for me is to like trace back things that I've done in the past that are very different from what I'm doing now and to try to see how those past experiences that seem very different on a surface level have impacted my approach or like my perspective with what I'm doing now as let's say so my question is when you look back at that experience that you just mentioned and your experience in theater and we've already talked a little bit about traveling but how do you think there if there's maybe like one thing that you carry with you today Mm -hmm. that impacts how you look at development as a bubble developer or how you like approach it is there is there anything that comes to mind yeah this feels like a very strong through line is the um well now i can't even articulate it but (laughs) it feels really clear in my brain it's this sort of combination of like super focused practice 
and study, right? So mm. in my religious years, I I was like earnestly studying the Bible and and like every single day, twice a day, you know. I I really spent so much time like trying to understand I don't know, humanity or like being a human in this world, whatever. And like that was a, the focus of my life, right? And when I was, so I was more a music kid than a theater kid, but I was like in the musicals, right? So I studied uh, opera in undergrad and grad, grad school. And that is, you are in a practice room for, by yourself, tiny little room for hours, studying language, practicing, just like making a note, just making that sound. But you know what I mean? Like you'll spend weeks trying to make one sound and hmm. you're obsessive about it, right? It's obsession, I think, is the thing that's kind of, and I'm not like an obsessive person, but I practiced being obsessive, which made me like a, I am not going to ever say I was a successful singer because I was not, but I think that like I, I achieved my goals in getting a master's degree. I could sing really impressive arias and like, you know, I was an opera singer that had not yet had any professional work and never did. I never did. I, I quit as soon as grad school was done or thereabouts. Anyway. Point is, then when I found Bubble, like, I was so laser focused on like, this is, I'm doing this now. And I spent every waking hour thinking about it, practicing, building stuff, learning, rebuilding. Yeah. So I think that that sort of like singular focus and actually spending real productive time on it. And, you know, practice is like 90% screwing up, right? You're mm -hmm. doing it wrong and then you're trying to do it right. Whereas like you could go into bubble and not think you have to do it wrong first before you can learn. I mean, you don't have to do it wrong first, but like, how are you going to learn to be a good bubbler if you don't screw everything up at least uh, once? I think, you, I think you actually do have to get it wrong first, like in order to, to learn anything. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that like having an experience of, of having to do that over and over again just primes you to sort of not think it's a bad thing when you when you screw up you know also and this is another one and church also i performed a lot like i was in the praise band <laughs> and then you know getting two degrees in music like you were performing constantly and so now i feel very comfortable talking to people i don't know i feel really comfortable presenting stuff i think that like there is not enough public speaking that happens in schools and, and that should be just required. You should be required mm -hmm. to do a presentation every single week on something, just whatever, read something out loud. So you get used to it, you know? Right. And I mean, you spoke earlier about how important being in that, um, but you, t you talked about the importance of, of being in on deck and surrounding yourself with the right people and then presenting at the end of that. Right. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and I mean, Twitter and, and all of that stuff, while you're being yourself and just kind of writing and it, it seems goofy, there is a, an aspect of that that is sort of a presentation, too. So it mm -hmm. all kind of works through, I think, too. Yeah. Kelly, I feel like we could talk for uh, many more hours and we should definitely do another yep. episode, but I think that's a good place to, to end it. So people can find you on Twitter at, what is it, Claus I Said So? Claus I Said So. Yep. Claus I Said So. Awesome. And I'll leave the links and all of that stuff into the description but thank you so much for coming on the show that was a blast and the uh, best. i hope we do it again yeah this was awesome. so fun all right okay bye everyone thanks for watching bye